when my case was, was overturned and they, they let me go, uh, I had no clothes. So I had to go in a room, a pile as tall as the ceiling, and just grab something. Whatever your hand hit, he told you to grab it. So my hand hit a jogging suit. Sleeves was this much longer and it smelled like a mule. Like, a, you know, a farm full of animals slept in it. Did I question it? No, I didn't. So, you know, I smelled like a raccoon or a possum or a skunk. And I went outside. Once they released me, and I stood in the rain for about three hours, three, four hours, smelling like this, until somebody I knew drove up and said, hey, you know, what you doing out here? I said, I just escaped. He said, man, you need a ride? I said, yeah. So he took me home, you know, took me first to buy me some clothes. And then, uh, you know, when I got a shower, and he took me to my mom's house. So it was an adventure leaving 26 County. I had $48 still on the books in 26. They wouldn't give it to me. I stood out. I was broke. I didn't have a dime. I couldn't have caught the bus, anything. I would have had to walk, you know, and, and I didn't have a dime. You know, and nobody cared how I made it home. Nobody at all. But my attorney left because he thought somebody was going to take care of me. Didn't have a dime. I stood out there smelling like a, a skunk for hours in the rain, pour down rain, you know, and uh, I felt really, I felt great about being free, but I felt terrible about how I was being treated. And I had no information to know that in order for you to file a claim against the state, you have, your time is running. I had none of that information because I was so excited just to be home. And not long, I went right in and gave my mother, you know, I had the operation with my mom. So she can live. You know, I think it's a blessing that it happened when it happened. Because uh, out of nine kids, I was the only one able to give her a kidney. You know, and uh, she did well for a long time. You know, and, and I got a chance to enjoy my mother for a number of years. And, but it's just sad. It's sad. This, this, this state is it's just in a bad condition, you know. I go look for a job. I got hired for a job as an engineer. Got hired for the job, nice building downtown. They hired me, they gave me a, a, a uniform, a pass key, my, my locker key, my uh, codes and all this kind of stuff. And uh, on a Friday, I interviewed Wednesday, I came in on Thursday. Friday I picked up my uniform, but Monday morning I was unemployed again. My background came up. We can't hire you because of this on your background. I said, well, I have all my paperwork. People on the top don't want to hear that. We can't hire you. It's a risk. We're not taking any risks. So I was out of work for a little while, you know. I had a family, had kids, until I started doing construction. And uh, some of this, these buildings I worked on, you know, all the masonry, and, you know, the bricks and the foundations and stuff, the interiors, you know. So I got into construction. And, uh, that's how I got on my feet. The state didn't do anything for me. Truth be told, I've been home 17 months now, and I'm still not used to being home yet. You know, when you go through being in maximum prison for so long, it's like, it's nothing that you just, okay, I'm home now. It's just be out of your mind just like that, because it doesn't, especially when you was there for something you didn't do. So it's like the nightmares from being in there for so long, and then, you know, sometimes you be nervous about stepping outside because you be like, man, I went outside before and this will happen. So you have to pick and choose where you go, who you go with, because it's so easy to get caught up in something else. So you have to, you have to basically monitor yourself out here. And that's why I say, even after doing all them years and being free, it's still like you've been, you locked up because you have to monitor yourself so much, so many different things. You know, hey, I cannot go to this party because I don't know what's going to happen at this party. I cannot go here because I don't know these people here. I can't. So it's like you monitoring yourself and you, you basically policing yourself all over again because you cannot do the things that you once did. And and it's like you enjoy life to the best of your ability, but it's like you have to police yourself because you don't never want to go through what you went through before. So and in many computer applications you can't explain it and you have to answer yes otherwise you're a liar. 
because it says, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And yes, I was, but I was exonerated. And it, so that, that's, a, that's a big hurdle. Tried to wipe it out, but it always keep coming back. A found effect of my life because, man, I had to learn everything, had to do everything for myself. And uh, it was like unbelievable because uh, the only way I got through it was through my family. Yeah, my family and my faith. So she ran into him and basically took, that was her first pro bono case, and she said murder trials are huge undertakings, especially when there's a confession. Roughly, she said 99% of, you know, a murder trial with a confession will end in a guilty verdict. So I'm in a total uphill battle, but I believe this kid when he said he saw the fight and walked away. He said someone's going to get in trouble and he walked away. So I um, offered to help her with that case. I ended up trying it. Uh, with her to a not guilty, which was a huge relief. Um, but then he had been incarcerated for six years. Um, family had moved on. There was literally not a belonging anymore than anyone had for him. Um, he was given a Bible and um, a bus card and told good luck. So uh, I mistakenly thought that they, he, they were calling his mom his mom thought they were calling his lawyers, and they walked him out onto the street at 2 in the morning and just said, good luck. This is a kid who hadn't been on the street in six years. And so um, I talked to my co-counsel, and she said, look, I did the heavy lifting in the trial. We can't lose this kid. So um, along with a lot of other people who, a, a guard in the jail who we met, a, a wonderful woman who had been a minister in the jail, um, we all tried to help him get an ID, get a job, get some clothes. I mean, I literally pulled over with a car full of, I had just called everybody that I knew who was a large <laughs> or XXL and said, send anything you have. And we just tried on clothes because he didn't know what he liked anymore. He didn't know what he was supposed to look like. So that was really my first exposure to someone who was innocent and who had been incarcerated and who then had been released. So um, a couple years after that, I wrote a book about him called Long Way Home, uh, A Young Man Lost in the System and the Two Women Who Found Him. And it was, a, it was sort of cathartic for both he and I and my co-counsel, and that was going to sort of be it. But as I was writing it and researching it, I kept hearing from people, especially lawyers, hey, do you know that's what happens to people often? when they're innocent, when DNA proves they're innocent, when a witness recantation occurs, when it's overturned for ineffective assistance of counsel, when someone's case is overturned, that's often what happens to them. They're often walked onto the street and given a clap on the back, maybe a bus card, and told good luck, essentially. I mean, even if, you know, I would come to find out that even when we see these um, just fantastic sort of jailhouse scenes where the lawyers are around and you guys have been there, it's thrilling and but we all know innocence is just the beginning those cameras go after for 20 minutes and you're in a car for the first time and you got to go figure out where you're going to live most of the time your family's moved well on because they've had to because you as the innocent person in jail told them to um, but it's just a, a freakish nightmare uh, of something to handle when you've already had the surreal experience of being put in jail for something you didn't do. And now you have the surreal experience of someone finally believes you and people believe you and you get out. There's like, it, no one knows what to do. Um, so as I was told that this, what I saw with my client, Jovan Mosley, what I saw what happened with him, I was told by Rob Warden at the Center on Wrongful Convictions. I was started reaching out. I met Barry Sheck and he, everybody said, oh, the starting over part is, is huge. Barry Sheck said to me, it might be the hardest part of the process. Um, so Loyola Law School, uh, Loyola University Chicago, decided to open a clinic where the law students would represent exonerees, people who've been exonerated. Um, so it's a legal and social clinic um, where we will do legal work like help to get their records expunged, we will go down to Springfield and try to get legislation passed, which would make that um, expungement automatic if you got a certificate of innocence, 
or we do social work like trying to get a job, find housing. Um, if you're lucky enough to get a settlement, but not everybody is, we'll try to get some counseling, you know, financial counseling, or even before that. Um, expungement or sealing or getting someone's record clean is, is so everything. I mean, we all know we're living in this world now where we can find, you, you look at Google your neighbor and you're like, oh, um, well, imagine when someone Googles someone who was in jail for a heinous crime like murder or something involving children. Um, we would send Life After Innocence clients on interviews. We'd get them interviews. And um, for example, Jerry Miller went to a Hudson book group um, uh, in Midway Airport. And they loved him, as I knew they would. And they called, and he called, and everybody was happy. We're giving him a job. It's going to be so fun. They called him on the way home. Sorry, we just ran your record. And you still have that on your record. And he said, but you saw my like Chicago Tribune article, right? Like where the prosecutor essentially said, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, everyone agrees that I'm the DNA, that everyone agrees it wasn't me. It showed conclusively it wasn't me. And the HR person said, yeah, but it's on your record. So, and their rules are that they can't hire someone who has a record like that. So um, it also affects housing now. People are running background checks. Anything you can imagine, which is everything, including lending now and all these other things, if you have a background check, even when it's overturned, it will show up. And so it, it won't even, sometimes it'll say dismissed or nolly prost if you went into the record, but the average HR person or the average person running a background check will never go into that record. So they'll just see conviction. And so they, you know, I can understand where they validly say, we cannot hire someone with this record. So if you get it expunged, that goes away. If for some, if you, uh, you know, roll through a stop sign and you get pulled over, when the cop pulls you over, that won't come up. That's a huge thing too. Exonerees will get pulled over for like an average traffic stop, and just like all of us, the police officer or sheriff will will put in your license plate number, and up comes. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Well, imagine how they those cops feel when you have like a, con a convicted murderer and sex offender in the car ahead of you. They're getting ready, and they're coming to that car, and they're not like, "Hi, sir, did you know you were going 15 and a 10?" Like they're usually defensive, as they should be. So that goes away too with expungement. So your life goes a lot, lot, a lot, 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 lot better. <laughs> and you can start over easier. Absolutely. I mean, if it hadn't been for the loving support of my family, I'd have been homeless. You know, I walked out with the clothes on my back. I had no clothes. I had no home. I had no car. I had no job. I needed dental work done because of the lack of health care in prison. And I could no longer uh, do carpentry work construction work. I was 54 years old, but I tried. I started out working and making uh, seven bucks an hour. And when I realized I couldn't climb anymore, I went to work in a printing company. 12 hour days, grueling. And learned a new trade, worked that for five years. And, but I had to do that, and the only way I could do it was leave. And that's what most exonerees need to do, is they can't go back home to their own backyard and expect life to be sweet again. It's not going to be. You're going to run into many prejudices and naysayers. You can't find a job. A lot of people, a lot of these guys need mental health care. I put myself through forensic psychological training once I got out because I had insurance. And after two years of that, he told me, you don't need to come back anymore because I'd already got involved with Witness to Innocence telling my story. It's therapeutic on one hand, it's traumatizing on the other. That's the only way I had it getting back at these people. To have somebody uh, just come out of prison, those are the things you need immediately. You know, you need to have not a hand out, but a hand up. And I think that's what most people want and need. And really, I really started from zero. Yeah, I... I did, I did, the only people that I had to, uh, that I had to count on was Donna, her husband. Uh, even the day that I got out of jail, I went to, to stay with him, to live with him, until everything was clear. Um, 
and then I started to work, basically. And then I went to the uh, University of Portland to study. No, and they, say that I, they said that I needed the help there, help me, but I haven't received no help. The state's attorney in the work at work inside the Kane County Courthouse. She, I, I, I took it as she been sarcastic. She was like, I guess you don't need our help no more since you finna get some money from the state. I didn't say nothing back. I just kept walking. Nope. No education. I had to do it on my own. I had to. I um, enrolled to a, a Labonzi Community College to get my GED, and I had. Uh, they said they're gonna help me get in when I pass the GED. They're gonna help me take some college courses to uh, foresee my. Uh, Cause I want to be a veterinarian. They said they're gonna help me look into that. You have to. You have to start your life over from a place that it, it, it stopped. And I was 22 never been arrested before. I was envisioning, you know, I was a, somewhat of an athlete before I had uh, went to prison. I was uh, a discus thrower, and uh, I was I was very good, at, very good at what I did, though. I was an all-marine champion for three years in a row. I was thrown in a high 190 feet range. I was, uh, you know, wanted to go to the Olympics. What, what was I going to do with myself? I was 30-some years old, beat down from drugs and everything else in prison life. Uh, you know, bad food and bad hygiene in that place. You just, you know, it was hard to even get a shower or dietary uh, restraints, uh, restraints or something. I mean, it was just an awful place. So how do you start from where you've been to, to, to that? Just trying to get a job. Trying to get a job. Uh, have you ever been convicted of a crime before? Uh, yeah, but I didn't do it. I mean, all that comes into play, you know, have you ever been convicted, have you ever, you know, been in jail, and how do you answer that? I went to one uh, tool company that I worked for in the early days and uh, got a job, you know, just assembling, making tools, you know, and um, I couldn't, uh, they wanted my pardon, they wanted my, uh, my, you know, when I'd been released, they wanted everything, and then that turned into a big fiasco because the state was still trying to say that, you know, I was implicated in this thing. And, you know, I'm trying to get a job. People were writing child murder in my truck, in the dirt, you know, and leaving nasty phone calls on the phone. Because back in those days, they didn't know what DNA was. And, you know, they thought it was some sort of shaman science, like get out of jail free card. Thing. For me, it works. For others, it doesn't. Some guys we know, Randy and Alex, well, they're homeless. They're sitting on the street, don't know where they're going to get their next meal. Um, and it's hard for them. It is so difficult for people like that. For what my experience has been with different exonerees, um, and I use the term, even just the term exoneree is interesting because it has sort of its own definition of someone who's been, you know, declared innocent in some way. And that is, and we may get into this differently, but one of the issues moving forward in the movement is you know, the definitions and the labels that we assign to people once they're released and what that means for them moving forward. Um, to be declared an exoneree puts you in the best position possible moving forward. Um, and then, you know, there are those who are released from prison who we know and believe are innocent but that aren't declared innocent by the court or by some other means. And so then they sort of linger out there and don't have that actual title of exoneree and their life is even more difficult. But um, generally speaking, the issues that I see as most common with exonerees and those that have been released from prison include, you know, financial issues, um, which are immediate. So basically, like in most states, if not every state, the person is released from prison and that's it. The, you know, and you see on TV sometimes or like in a movie, someone's getting out of prison and they give them this box of all the stuff they came in with, like, that doesn't even happen. <laughs> That's more than what actually happens in reality. The person who gets out just walks out the doors and that's it. Um, and so, you know, then it differs between, you know, what is the support system that's in place for that person. So if someone walks out of prison and has a huge family support and they've got somewhere to go live and they have people to go home to, generally their life will probably be a little bit easier to you know get more reacquainted to things versus someone who walks out of prison and doesn't really have anywhere to go and then 
it's sort of up to the people that got him out and their you know supporters to try to figure out a way to help this person um, and so the immediate financial issues are really severe so literally like where does the person where does the exonerate where does he spend the night that first night he's out where does he go to buy the jeans and t-shirt that he needs or if he has a court appearance where does he go to buy the shirt and tie and how does he pay for it um, and then moving further down the line is the long-term financial issues of you know renting an apartment or buying a car or doing the things that you need to have to have a structured you know secure life and then you have all the sort of the identification issues which I've also encountered which is someone walks out of prison and has no official ID except for their prison ID, if they even can leave with that. So then you have to start the process of getting them a driver's license or a state ID card or some sort of form of identification and getting the social security card. All these things that, you know, the average person doesn't really have to worry about once they, you know, sort of come of age and they have all their identification, all their documents. I mean, someone who's been in prison for 25 years or 20 years doesn't have their birth certificate, doesn't, and how you get those things is by having all the other documents, and so you have to acquire them all, and it's really difficult and frustrating. So I think then also that sort of leads to the psychological issues of, you know, how frustrating that would be. So the state wrongly convicts me for something I didn't do. I spent 20 years in prison. 20 minutes in prison would be too long, but let's see, you're coming out after 20 years. You miss so much of your life, and it's, you know, it's, the, the system did not work. It failed you. But you're put out into the world, and now you have to spend all this energy and find the resources, and it's exhausting. I mean, just to acquire the basic necessities of life is so difficult, and there's no state structure in place to help you do that. So it's, you know, the people that sort of put you there, so to speak, don't do anything once you're out to really help you. And I think that psychologically, I can only imagine, would be really just hurtful and damaging. Um, and then, you know, there's also other issues as well, like, you know, I think a lot of guys have post-traumatic stress disorder and um, to some degree or another, how could you not, you know, spending all those years inside locked up in a cell that's so inhumane and being there for something that you didn't do. Um, I also think that, you know, there are quite a few individuals who have spent a lot of time outside of prison fighting their cases and their life becomes that and so you know you sort of become this advocate for yourself and it becomes your life is to clear your name and to make this right and then once it happens it's this glorious victory but it's also sort of bittersweet because it's like okay now what you know now I this has been your mission for a you know quarter century for this huge chunk of your adult life if not your entire adult life and now you've accomplished this and it's amazing and it's like the miracle of all miracles that is impossible to achieve. But now that sort of identity that you had is over and now you're just a regular person out in the world and you have to do the same struggles and worse what, from what other people have. And I think that is a difficult you know, thing to face. And Another thing, too, is when someone's released from prison, there's a lot, in many cases, a lot of sort of media hoopla around their release. And so there's a lot of attention, and people are calling, and people are asking you how you're doing and paying attention. And, and then over time, it sort of just dissipates and slowly fades away. And then the calls stop, and, you know, that happens. And then, but if there's news about potential civil suit and money that you may receive down the line, people start calling again. And then I think there's trust issues. And if you have old family members that never supported you while you were in prison and now all of a sudden they're calling you and wanting to come to the barbecue and you just think, does this person have ulterior motives? And so then that creates a whole other sort of set of issues of like who to trust, who not to trust. And, and, and it's hurtful, I think, and the person, and this is me sort of, you know, projecting my own, I guess, thoughts and, and viewpoints on it. But I think you just think like, you know, you want to have a family and you want to be part of that world that you missed for so long. But you just wonder what people's motivations are. And so it's, you know, a lot of issues. Share with you what it is like to be an exoneree. Someone who is given a chance to live a life again after having had mine taken away through being wrongly convicted. You are a different person than existed when you were convicted and imprisoned. The disillusionment 
leaves a deep indentation on the soul. Who am I now? Where do I even fit in? And what can I do here? Because no matter how wonderful being freed is, you can't get past the fact that a wrongful conviction obliterates your previous life and its view of reality. You know, I think I'm still going through. I There's a kind of crazy that this takes you to. Um, there's an abyss that um, you come to the edge of. But, you know, what was it one guy told me, your damaged goods? I was damaged goods. Um, you know, still am, everybody is. We've all got baggage. Um, so, you know, I was free. Uh, traumatized, uh, spent a whole lot of time, you know, scared to death every night when I went to bed, shook, cried, had to be held, um, checked the doors locked 150 times. I have a service dog now. He's not with me this week. That's huge. A um, lot of dysfunction, moving towards more function. Um, you know, here I am, finally kind of functional and able to earn some money for a living. <sighs> you know, it, it um, it's like anybody that's gone through something traumatic. You do your best with the resources you have. You know, I was very fortunate. I had family and help. Some people don't. Um, most people, <laughs> honorees, you know, what's happening afterwards, how do you get from, you know, there to the job? and I'll tell you something I have found with most exonerees. We're not good at admitting it. I'm one of the few who will, but we spend some time in the fetal position. Some of us a week at a time. Um, most of them won't tell you that, but it's a difficult path. Most of them can get up front and sound really good, but um, there's usually some backstage fetal position going on. Some of it lasts for quite a while. We need people who accept us. There's nothing like the rejection of, of society saying, you are a horrible, disgusting monster. And boy, you get it.